difference. But it was quite a bit more. It was tens of thousands of dollars more than that person was going to get to sell her home. She didn't know. And that's unfortunate. That puts everybody in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. Now she can't sell her home because she's got liens against it, which she didn't know. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and this is The Closing Table, where we talk to experts about their experience in real estate all across the country. Let's go. Closing table. I'm your host, Kevin C. McIntosh, and joining us on this episode, we're ready to get some more knowledge about real estate in her specific market. We want to welcome Sherry Flaherty to the show. How are you, Sherry? I'm great, Kevin. How are you doing? Doing just good. Doing just good. good. Thank you again for accepting our invitation to be here as a guest on the closing table. We appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Appreciate the invitation. Yeah, yeah. So I, I hear you have some knowledge that you want to share with us regarding real estate. I'm excited for it. But before we even move into it, I want you to talk about yourself. You know, I want you to, in 60 seconds or less, if possible, tell us who you are outside of real estate. Okay. Outside of real estate, I've been married for 41 years. My husband, Dennis, is Ooh. also in real estate industry as well. So we are working mm -hmm. together. And I have two kids and uh brandy and sean and i've got three grandchildren and another one on the way so outside of real nice. estate i love spending time with the family and mm -hmm. uh love having we have sunday dinners every week and so love getting together with them for sunday dinners i love to hear that as a family man myself i i, I value the same thing time Ooh. with family i can't wait to get home to my family now so good Absolutely. to hear good to hear mm -hmm. sherry so, so describe your real estate business for us. Just describe okay. it however you can, but if you are able to hit on these three key points, how long you've been licensed, what your uh, niche or specialty is, and uh, some of your notable achievements, if so. Okay, so I got my real estate license in 2015 after being in the corporate world, mostly in HR for over 30 years. So I actually mm. wanted to do something. We sold our company and I wanted to do something where I could go home at the end of the day. I did a lot of traveling several times a month and I wanted to have a career that I had kind of my own entrepreneurial uh, spirit that I could add to it. And I wanted to be mm -hmm. able to go home at the end of the day. So I thought real estate would be a good opportunity. My husband actually got his license two years before me. So I got to see a little bit about how it was working. And I got my license in 2015 and we worked with another brokerage and um, I missed a little bit of what I was doing in HR in the corporate world because mm. I was out showing homes and selling homes and getting listings. But I didn't have that team of people that I had worked with in the past. So we started a team. We had 10 people on our team. And in 2018, I got my broker's license and we purchased this franchise. So I'm the broker and owner mm. of Real Estate One Group Platinum in Pittsburgh. And I nice. think my niche is working with people that want help to be successful. So I like coaching people, counseling, and training. And I, I love selling houses as well. But I really like the people aspect of it and the business aspect of it. So I'm really a business person who became a realtor and then became mm. a broker. Sometimes a realtor becomes a broker or a, owns a brokerage. But I already had the business experience, so I feel like I brought that with me. So my niche is already understanding how a business runs, how you make money, and how to motivate people and help them be successful. Oh, that's definitely a, a specialty right there and a skill in itself, being able to manage and operate a business, mm -hmm. especially right. from the ground up, you know? And you're your own boss. You're, you're the person that's responsible for... Uh, quote unquote, killing what you eat or eating what you kill essentially on right. a daily basis. So you got to go out there and put the boots to the ground. Love to hear that. So let's talk about where you do your business, Sherry. Talk about your, describe your market, I should say. And this is a two part question geographically. So talk about, you know, what's going on, where you are, what your area is known for, the attractions, things like that. And then get into some of the economics, some of the real estate data and statistics going on there currently. Okay. So we are in Pittsburgh. We, we service all of the Pittsburgh metropolitan area and all the surrounding counties as well. 
So as an example, we're in Allegheny County. We have three offices mm -hmm. in Allegheny County. We have one in Bridgeville, we have one in Moon Township, and we have one in West Mifflin. And each of those areas inside of Allegheny County, in Allegheny County alone has 130 municipalities. So Pittsburgh is a very diverse place, not just in the city, but in the municipalities as well, in the suburbs. But with the 130 different municipalities, that's a lot for a realtor to learn about, to learn the different areas. And in our area, it's very common that a buyer is looking in a particular school district. So sometimes they're looking in a school district right. or sometimes they just want to live in the city or they just want to live in a particular municipality. So there's a lot to know. There's a lot of different uh, there's actually more municipalities in Allegheny County than any other county in Pennsylvania. So hmm. we also uh, will go somewhat outside of the Pittsburgh municipalities as well, and typically to all the counties that surround it. Currently, um, and Pittsburgh is a pretty stable economy, so we don't see the ups and downs like we've seen in uh, some other locations where prices you know, double in a short period of time and they significantly right. drop. We don't typically have that here. Uh, but what we do have is some study, um, some study appreciation of your home. So typically mm -hmm. you can buy a house and over a couple of years, it's going to increase in value. Currently, our average mm -hmm. sales price for a single family residential home is about $228,000. And currently the average time on market is about 45 days. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Over yeah, so a month. That's yeah, that's happened really? over just the past probably month or so. So our big time for selling is for people who want to change, get into a school district in particular, and they mm -hmm. want to be able to get into their home before the school season starts. So we have a lot of closings that take pay place, May, June, July, August. And there's a little I bit of a slowdown. September, it slows down a little bit. And mm. so when it slows down, we've got less inventory on the market, but we also have less buyers as well. So things right. now are sitting a little bit longer. The interest rates are up a little bit and the market isn't what it was even just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So 45 days is a, probably a pretty good average for us right now. That's crazy. That's probably the longest I've heard on this show so far this year. That, that's kind of crazy. But I've also been hearing about the how the days on the market has been increasing over the last couple months or so or since right. the beginning of the year, I should even say. But you say the 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 purchase price or the sale price property price whatever we want to call it is pretty much has been stable so it the the pandemic really didn't affect or shoot up the prices as much as it did in other markets it did back in 2021 and 2022 well yeah yeah so yeah, yes yeah. it did interesting, and going, interesting. You, as soon as you got it listed you were getting them under contract so still if yep, you have a yep. move-in ready home and you price it right it'll probably sell very quickly but if you looked at the yeah, app, yeah, of you would see more of that 40 to 45 day range right now. Interesting. Okay, okay. Let's dig deeper. So you already talked about your background in HR. Uh, very impressive. That shows that you do have leadership skills, but putting that into, translating that into real estate, how's your experience in HR shaped your approach to leading a real estate team? And what unique qualities do you think you bring to your, your brokerage as a result? So I think there are a lot of things that I bring to the brokerage, like doing some training, not just on real estate, but on life in general. How do you have a good life? How do you set goals for yourself that are not just business related, mm. but personal goals as well? And so how do you have a good harmony and balance between your life and your work? And I've right. worked with lots of people. I've worked with thousands of people in HR over the past 30 years. And so I feel like I know how to identify somebody's skill set and kind of their innate characteristics and help them figure out what they need to do to be successful. And what I like about real estate is success is different for everybody. So when you're in the corporate mm -hmm. world, you have goals to meet, right? You have to sell so many of whatever it is or do something particular or show up to an office from nine to five. But in real estate, you don't have to do any of those things. Your success and your goals are dependent on what's most important to you. So we have agents that might sell several houses in a year, and we have agents that are going to sell 30 or 40 or 50 houses in a year. And so I feel like as an HR person with the HR background and business experience, I can help each of those people figure out how to meet what works best for them. And there is no right or wrong answer. So you choose as an individual, you're an entrepreneur as a realtor. 
and you decide how you want to mm -hmm. run your business as long as you're doing it ethically and legally you can decide how often you want to work and for the folks yeah. that you know want to work 40 hours or, mo or more a week they're going to be they can be very successful and make a lot of money and for other people it's just kind of like they're, they're just filling in maybe they don't want to have a full-time job outside of the home but they want to sell a few houses a year so it's a great opportunity for so many different people and I feel like the what's important to me is that everyone that comes into our brokerage feels welcome. They feel important. They feel like they belong here. And I don't want them ever to feel like they don't get treated well because they don't sell as many homes as somebody else. I want everybody right, right. to feel like it's a great place to work. Yeah, yeah. So, and I love that you started with this success is subjective, you know, mm -hmm. in, in any field, in any part of life. So That's what right. one person may be chasing, like you said, 50 closings a year, 100 closings a year. Another person mm -hmm. may be OK with 10, 12 yeah. year, one a month, mm -hmm. something like that. But exactly. I like I like that you also mentioned the fact that, you know, you are a coach, you are a leader and you don't just lead with the business you also help lead and, and give them guidance in life in general and right. i feel like that's that should be the position of anyone in a leadership position right because yes. whether you're a baseball coach basketball coach hockey coach real estate coach you you do want to you know make a lot of similarities and analogies to real life when yes. it comes to their business because it, it helps tie things into to each other exactly and the person has to come first correct correct yeah. great point great point so uh, your your parents they played a, played a significant role in you Great know day. you shaping your your strong work ethic and your leadership qualities, as they should. What you know, but I, and I like that. But can you share a specific childhood memory or lesson that you learned from your parents that continues sure. to influence your professional life today? Yes, absolutely. So. My parents, who are still around, uh, both had a great work ethic, and they were divorced mm -hmm. when I was very young. So I really was raised by a single mother who always mm -hmm. had to work to make ends meet. So yeah. I am used to seeing somebody get up every day and go to work and have a great work ethic and sometimes mm -hmm. working two or three jobs to be able to pay the bills. And my father Ooh. was an entrepreneur, still an entrepreneur, and he had a great work ethic as well. So I saw him, we saw him on a regular basis, and he was very influential as well because he was also a hard worker. He had a great work ethic, and he was always around. He was a great advisor, a great consultant. And so I feel like mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to have two very good parents who always have my back, still do. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody in their life needs a backup system. And usually your backup system is a family member or some, and I, I felt like I had it in both parents. So I felt like I always had backup. Even, even today, I could go to either one of them and get advice or vent or whatever it is you might need to do. So I've had been very fortunate to have good parents. We love our parents. Shout out to the we moms, did. the dads of the world, grandfathers, yeah. grandmothers. We love them. They, like you, they are the backbone. And then yeah. if you are in a position to be best enough to, to have a, a, a child of your own, you essentially have to take on that road also. But That's it's right. beautiful that you had, you had parents who were, you know, two different ends of the spectrum, if, if, if I could say that. One right. who was an entrepreneur, made the money on their own, went out about that action, and another right. one who was just a very, very hard worker, you know, in the jobs that she obtained. And, yes. and, and both of those instilled the work ethic, the hustle, yes. and the heart that you have. I love yeah. to hear that. And I think I I, to what that. I try to do is take the best of both of those and bring yep. those together. Mm -hmm. And hopefully be, and I, be a good backup. We can only hope we give that to our kids. That's right. Yep. Love that, love that, Sherry. You um, do you do any volunteering, volunteer events in your community? So we just did something a little while ago in our office that I thought was pretty nice. Um, so the situation that's going on in the Ukraine uh, was taking place, mm -hmm. and our CEO is an immigrant from Poland. His name is Kuba, and Kuba has a wife, mm -hmm. Luba, and Luba is from the Ukraine. And their children wanted to know mm -hmm. what they could do to help some of the relatives and the family members and people that they knew in the Ukraine that were needed to get out of Ukraine. And they put together some shoe boxes that they had sent to them. And Cuba came up with the idea of sharing with other franchisees that this might be something we want to participate in as well. So we brought it out to all of the agents and it was fantastic. I never participated in anything quite like this before. And each of the agents and family members could get together and put together shoe boxes of items you thought might be important to people that had to flee the Ukraine. 
So they didn't get sent to the Ukraine. They got sent to places like Poland or places they were going to so that right. they had something from to know that somebody cared about them. Someone cared about the situation they were in. So for me personally, I have very young grandchildren, but they got to be part of this. We did a thing on one of our Sunday dinners. We had everybody around the table and they colored pictures for children and they put they had toys that I purchased and they could select and put into their shoe boxes and send them, put them together for the children in Ukraine. And one of the best stories that came out of it is one of our agents called me, his name is Z. And I had no idea about this, but Z told me a story. Z was a refugee from Bosnia when he was about eight years old. And Z remembers when he received a shoe box from an American kid. And he described wow. what's in it. And I still remember what is in it. He had a pair of white socks. He had some little cars and trucks that he could play with. And he had one of those paddle ball things that has the paddle and the string with a ball on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, got that. Yeah. And he got a bar <laughs> nice. of lever soap. And he said to me, I can mm. still pick out the scent of lever soap out of a thousand different scents. Yeah. And I too. thought, wow, <laughs> what a story. And he actually, yeah. I said to him, you need to connect with Cuba on social media and tell him your story. And he did. And Cuba, as a result, remember just recently we went to Las Vegas for the Realty One Group Summit, and he invited Z as his guest, all expenses paid, to come and be part of our summit. And every wow. agent can't afford that. It's something everybody has to pay for. So he was able to go as Cuba's guest because he was able to relate his story that was similar to the story that we were dealing with at the time. That's so beautiful. for me, that is probably one of the greatest volunteer opportunities that we've done yeah 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 you make a direct impact in helping people you know that, right. that really needs it more more yes. than anything and then to have someone who could share a story about how that same thing like actually helped them change them That's and, amazing. and how it affected them that is very, very amazing actually yeah. wow wow interesting I, yeah okay okay so um i, I got this quote i want you to uh, uh, listen, listen to this. Uh, you might be familiar with this. 85% of your financial success is due to your personality and your ability to communicate, negotiate, and lead. Shockingly, only 15% is due to technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. So negotiation is the key element in the real estate deals, but could you describe a challenging negotiation scenario that you've encountered in this market and how your skills played a role in achieving success? Yes. So um, as a newer realtor, I was making an offer on a house where uh, and the person that I was working with really wanted the house. And we could tell by the number of people that were scheduled to see it the first two days that it was available, that this was going to have multiple offers on it. Mm -hmm. So we wrote an offer. We wrote a reasonable offer right at asking price. And we turned in the offer and we found out that we ended up getting the offer. And the reason that we got the offer is because the contract was written correctly. Right. We were nice to work with. We weren't being pushy to the listing mm -hmm. agent. And he shared mm -hmm. with my clients at the closing table, the other agent did, that because we were easy to work with and all the basic stuff that you're supposed to do as a realtor was done correctly, that's why we got the offer. <laughs> Other people were turning in, some people were turning in contracts that weren't complete. That happens. It happens in the real estate world. And I think what a realtor would be very surprised to know is that sometimes when you're in that situation, when you're negotiating, when you're making offers, and I always tell people, if, two, if you have two good agents, you're going to have a smooth transaction. You can figure out almost everything. But if right. you don't and somebody else is difficult to work with, you're not going to have a smooth transaction. So sometimes your offer is going to get accepted because they like you, because you're a good person, because you're doing the basic stuff right, and because yeah. you're not asking yeah. for special favors. So, And I think that 85% thing really fits into kind of the 80-20 rule that goes with everything you do in life. So mm. in real estate, for example, 20% of the agents sell 80% of the work sell 80 percent of the yeah. homes the commercial <laughs> <Yep>. crop <laughs> in the corporate world the same thing happens right when you go into a retail yeah. store you're at a in a job that you have in the corporate world 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work and mm -hmm. 
another, you know, there are so many things in your personal life that refer to that as well. 20% yeah. of your clothing, you're wearing it 80% of the time. 80% of the time you walk on 20% of your carpet. There are so many things that you do in your life that 80-20 rule applies to. And I think it also applies to how successful you are. Good people are successful at whatever they choose to do. So I don't need to necessarily mm. stay in HR or stay in being an engineer, whatever it is I went to school for, I could go apply that to anything. If I'm good at one thing, I'll be good at another thing. If I like it, you're good at what you like and you like what you're good at. And if you apply that 80 for 20 rule and you always try to be in that 20% of the people that are doing 80% of the work, you're always gonna be successful. So yeah. I think that's the most important thing for realtors to understand. Be the 20%, don't be the 80%. Be the 20% who are getting things done. Be the person who's great to work with and people like you and they wanna work with you. When you people start to get a reputation when they're not great to work with, and then you mm. don't think, oh, I don't wanna sell, I hope I don't sell this house because maybe this person isn't gonna be as nice to work with as other people I've dealt with in the past. That is crazy. First and I'm foremost, I'm today years old. Well, not really, but it's crazy to hear that your contract got accepted just off of the fact that you just did the basic fundamental things right. Correct. Didn't even go over asking from what you said. That is crazy. First right. and foremost, let me change my words. It's not crazy. That's you doing your job. That's you doing your job. It's crazy to hear that there's agents not even doing the basic foundation parts of their job to get an offer accepted. That's wild to me. That's it's, wild to me. It's like that in every... But also, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's so crazy to me, but it, uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, that's what makes you stand out from other agents. It's just some, just right. something small like that. that. That small percentage of, of, of work that you do just, just makes the huge the hugest difference right so um i, I feel like I, I heard a story earlier today about something similar to that i can't necessarily put my finger on it. I'm, I'm drawing a blank but it's, it's just all i think what i think it was, you said something about good people are good no matter what they do they're good at what that's what i just recently i heard someone mention this maybe on a podcast but it was someone it might have been an athlete who transitioned from athletics to broadcasting or something like right. that and people were just speaking on their skills and how they're they 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 translated from being good at this to being great at this mm -hmm. and that's literally only a select few of people like that 80 20 yes. you i feel like you were talking to me because i feel like i wear only 80 20 percent of my outfits 80 percent of the time that's too right. so Everybody as does. you were saying that yeah as you were saying that, i'm like this is so true mm -hmm. so yeah it, it, it's it's great that you brought light to that and even i just yeah it makes so much yeah. sense it's, it's just it just breathes some things just breathe familiar familiarity familiarity right. and then you just get used to it right wow interesting can you talk about a time where you face some type of setback some type of obstacle during a real estate transaction let's not even not anyone but let's let's maybe the biggest obstacle that you've had to face. Talk about that and talk about what you did to overcome it. Um, maybe the biggest obstacle I have faced is maybe when a realtor might come in and something is gonna fall through and it's no fault of anybody's or no fault of either of the realtors. So I give mm -hmm. you, I'll give you an example. We had a situation recently where uh, we were representing, our agent was representing a buyer and everything seemed smooth both agents were doing a great job everything was moving along fine mm -hmm. everybody in the transaction was working the lender was doing a good job every buyer was qualified all the things that you want to happen for the transaction to come together and it turns mm -hmm. out there were some liens against the property but apparently the seller wasn't aware of them so you always go through a title search which is very important so you have mm -hmm. a title company that's going to do that work and make sure there aren't any liens there were liens against the property. The uh, owner was an elderly person who had to move out of the home to move into like an assisted living. And that individual didn't have any money to pay those liens. And there were gonna be more liens than the individual was going to get back. So Ooh. if the liens were less than what they were going to get back when they sold the house, then they would have paid it out of their proceeds and everything would have been okay. Yeah. And they would have got back the difference. 
but it was quite a bit more. It was tens of thousands of dollars more than that person was going to get to sell her home. She didn't know. Wow. And that's unfortunate. That puts everybody in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. Now she can't sell her home because she's got liens against it, which she didn't know. The buyer had no idea. They put money and time into it. They paid for a home inspection. They started, you know, working with their lender. The title company's done work. Everybody's done work. Both realtors have done work. And nobody's getting the house at the end of the day. Nobody's selling one. No one's buying one. Nobody's getting paid. So mm. those are the difficult ones. Usually when you have two good agents, you can figure it out. But this right. one's a little different. If it was $1,000 or something like that, the two agents would have probably come together and said, we'll split it. We'll each yeah. pay 500 And so there's lots of things when it's a smaller issue that you can always figure it out. But when it's tens of thousands of dollars, nobody's making that much money. So no one can, can really contribute to that. And it's not likely that the seller's family is going to all come together and put this money in when it's a lot of money. And she's got other expenses that she has to worry about. And so that was probably a, one of the most difficult situations because there was no resolution to it. Oh, Those are the oh top. I was waiting for that. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. Like, I was, I was ready for the solution at the end. But the only yes. solution to that is that they have to pay their liens, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, so now I couldn't I mean, that, imagine that going through that go as, back as a and buyer. Figure out. Maybe eventually she can work something out with whoever she owes the liens to. Most of them are going to be tax situations. She didn't have a mortgage that was paid for. So it's usually the, you know, the taxing authority. So mm. she might over time right, right. be able to work that out. But that wasn't going to happen quickly enough for this person to be able to buy the house in the time frame they needed to to buy it. And then my other I feel so bad because my other question is, so the buyer just had to take a loss on the money on the inspection. Was there earnest money deposit also? They get the oh. earnest money back, but yes, they just really took a loss. Oh, okay. on the oh. Yeah. But that's still some money. It that's is still some yeah. money. So I, whew, goodness gracious. Well, you know that that happens. You learn, you move you forward, mm -hmm. you know, it, and it's unfortunate. Like you said, there's, I mean, essentially, there's nothing that you or the other agent could have done proactively to prevent that either, right? It's, right. it's just part of the process once the title comes. That is so unfortunate. Mm -hmm. That is so it unfortunate. Is. Most people know. Most people know if they have a lien. Maybe they've got foreclosure notices. They know. Right, right, right. In case none of those things had happened. Oh, man. So okay. according to the individual, she wasn't aware. Okay. Well, okay. Let's take that out of the equation. Let's go to this situation here. Um, you yourself, scenario, you're a first time home buyer. You're seeking your first home in 2023, October, right? Current That's market conditions going on in your market. What approach would you take to owning your first home in today's market with the current conditions? Well, first of all, get the right people to work with you through the process. Mm -hmm. Find a realtor who has a good proven track record that you know, like, and trust. And make sure you get some referrals. Make sure, I mean, you could, should go out and ask people, who have you worked with? It's been great to work with. You can search mm -hmm. for people. You can do all the things you need to do. But a lot of times referrals are from people who have had success in working with that same realtor. So find a Correct. realtor who's knowledgeable. They're going to guide you through the process and educate you step by step. And you also want to make sure you've got the right lender. You want a local lender or a lender who's familiar with the local market. They know how things work. Mm -hmm. Because you want to mm -hmm. know a couple of things from that lender. Can I buy the house? Am I qualified to buy the house? And mm -hmm. what, do I, what kind of cash do I have to bring to close? And what's my monthly payment going to be? You need to know those things before you go make an offer. If you don't have a good lender and if you don't have a good realtor, you might not know those things or know them as well as you should. So you want to be educated through the process. You can do a lot of research. You can Google things and look them up. But you want the right professional that's working with you that has a fiduciary responsibility to you as your agent. So if you do that, Correct. and then you know that person will help you determine where your price range is, what do you want to buy, and then you need to think about what are the must-haves that I want in a home or building whenever I'm purchasing, and what are the nice-to-haves. Because maybe I can only mm -hmm. afford my must-haves. Maybe I can't get all the nice-to-haves. 
So you want to be able to share that with your realtor. This is what I have to have. If I don't have this, I'm not going to buy the house. These are other things I'd like to have as extras. And I think for the realtor, sometimes when it's a first-time home buyer, you're not buying your dream home. You're buying the dream, the home you can afford right now. In a couple of years, right. you're going to sell it and get your dream home. So you yeah. need the right person to guide you through the process and really set the right expectations. I love that. I love that you spoke on local lenders. Very important. I love that you spoke. Here's something I want to piggyback off what you said. Interview your agent. That's right. Ask your agent questions. Yes. Ask them about how long they've been licensed. Ask them how many clients they're currently juggling. Ask them about you know their recent transaction, you know their specialty or whatever the case may be. But that's something I feel like is a lost art. Not too many clients are asking their 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 agents, their, the realtors, right. the actual questions. Interviewing them, not just going with the first one or the the one that you. You know, right. like you said, was referred to someone who did have success. That doesn't mean you're going to have success with them. Right. So, uh, yeah, just to piggyback off that, I think that's a great point. Absolutely. And yes. find the agent who wants to interview you, too, because every mm -hmm. agent isn't a good fit for every home buyer either. That's a good point, too. That's a great point. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, for thank pulling you. up a chair sure. to the closing table. Being here, we appreciate that. At this point, if you have any last words and or want to tell people how to reach out to you, please do so now. If you'd like to reach out to me, I'm Sherry Flaherty at Realty One Group Platinum in Pittsburgh. Would love to talk to you about anything at all related to real estate, life, or anything else that you appreciate that you prefer. Absolutely. Thank you again, Sherry. We well, appreciate it. Great Absolutely. For our YouTube you. audience. Yep. For you our me. YouTube audience watching right now, do us both a favor and hit the like button, please, and thank you. Make sure you also share the content and subscribe to our channel. And if you are listening on Apple, Spotify, any other podcast platforms, please do the same. Give us a like, give us a five-star rating, and subscribe for our latest content. Hey, Sherry, before we get out of here, I'd like to leave our audience with a question. So this is for our audience right now. What did your parents teach you about real estate or home care that you believe was the most valuable information? Don't tell us now, put it in the comments below. Besides that, we'll talk to you next time.